Um, I'd like to introduce Philip Smith, who will be presenting the tutorial, B2P Techniques for Network Operators. Uh, Philip runs his own consulting company, PFS Internet Development, and has been speaking in the internet industry since the early 1990s, um, after catching the internet bug uh, in the mid-80s while at university. Um, Philip has graced the Nanox stage many times. Many of you folks have seen him, um, and he joins us today from Australia. Welcome back to Nanox, Philip. All right, thank you very much. Um, yes, I've certainly graced the Nanox stage quite a few times. I um, mean, if I look, if I look back in history, I was just actually looking at some of the previous slides that I'd done here, and of course, you know, this tutorial has been presented at Nanog many, many times as well. I think it was 2001 was the first time it was like, Philip, Philip, please, can you come and do a BGP tutorial at Nanog? And I was like, why? Because I, at that point I was working for Cisco and I was actually teaching BGP for many other parts of the world where the internet was still, well, what I considered was still developing and I always considered North America and Europe pretty developed, but anyway. So I did that, I did that for a good decade until I departed from Cisco and then the travel kind of stopped and um, I wasn't able to do, at least come back here so often. So anyway, I'm delighted to be back. Um, right now I'm um, doing contracting work for the Network Startup Resource Center. I've been doing that for the last 10 years amongst other things I do and delighted that NSRC was able to support my trip here. Um, Great to be back with everybody. I can hardly see a lot of new faces. I haven't been here for 13 years. I, I still, there's still some folks I remember from the old days. Um, and it's great to, great to be re reacquainted with, with some of you. Now, the other thing with this is, this is the tutorial, I was saying to Jason, this is the tutorial that I've been doing for quite a few years. Um, of course, a lot has happened. Um, I mean, even in some from pre-pandemic pre -pandemic times. Um, so the slides are updated. You've probably started looking at the slide deck it's on, if it's on the website, and you go, how on earth is Philip going to get through 260 slides in two hours? I'm not. This is the entire tutorial. I'll just go as far as I can in the time that I have. And well, once, once I run out of time, that's it. Um, if you like it, please provide the feedback. I'm sure Nanog would love to hear if this was any good or not. Um, if it was any good, maybe I can come back, carry on with this bit. This is part of a series of three tutorials. So this one is more about best practices, so background of BGP, the best practices, and so forth, rather than just reading out the RFC, which is boring, or just reading out a vendor doc, which is also a bit boring. Anyways, so slides are on, should be on the Nanog website um, today. Um, at least going by how yesterday's slides all appeared. And I also keep them on my own page as well, um, just for, for reference also. Um, also, I mean, it's hard to say make this interactive when I'm standing in front of a fairly big room, but if you have questions you'd like to ask, uh, don't, please don't wait for two hours to the end of it. Um, I mean, we have the mics in the middle, usual story, just say who you are and who you represent because this is being recorded uh, for future posterity. So if you have a question you'd like to ask somewhere in the middle, feel free, jump up to the mic and ask that as well. Um, also, if it helps, and I realize and we did this a while back also, uh, NSRC has actually made video recordings of quite a few parts of this uh, presentation as well. We did this just before the pandemic. Uh, we just sat down for a week and recorded, and they're all small snapshots, so you don't have to sit through two hours of yap, yap, yap for me to try and figure out you know, a particular topic you want to see. So uh, we, have, we have this on the website. It's, it's meant for the community. I'm not trying to promote anything, but it's meant for the community consumption here all around the world. Uh, so feel free to jump on there if there's something here that didn't quite make sense. Although I should say, and that was, I was kind of nervous doing that recording four years ago, this goes out of date really quickly. Um, so the parts in there that we have to update, I know we have to update them. Um, so we'll just give us a bit of time to, to do that. Um, right. So what I'm going to look at are these four areas in two hours. Well, I'll, I don't know. I'll probably get about halfway through it. So the first piece is really going through the basics. Um, 
And I approach this all from the point of view of, uh, from a service provider perspective. So I started my internet thing actually when I was at university, late 80s, um, because then it was kind of, at least in the UK where I'm from, it was kind of under the table, you don't pay any attention to this type of thing because we were using, what was it, X25 or whatever. And so started being really interested in how the network works, IP-based network worked. I worked for the UK's first ISP for five years. That became part of the UUNet empire. And then I joined Cisco in 98, but not to sell stuff, but it was very much more help build infrastructure globally. So one of these really weird people who actually wasn't trying to sell things, working for a vendor and just put on a plane and go flying places and try help. Uh, so we did a huge amount of training, a huge amount of helping operators figure out how to make the networks work. So it was not, again, coming along, preaching a book at somebody, but trying to work out what the real problems were, the real solutions, and so forth. So a lot of what's in here is actually best practice from what everybody's doing around the world. It may not suit entirely what you're doing, which is fine, understandable, but it's a lot of hard-learned lessons from lots and lots of years. And it's a nice thing with being this role and being in so many different parts of the world is you find out what everybody is trying to do and the problems they're trying to solve. So, the first piece would be BGP basics. And I really want to have a look at what BGP is. Now, we saw Len Bosek and the famous napkin envelope. Well, it was a napkin that um, was rescued that showed the initial diagram of how the BGP state machine would work. Um, I'm not going to go there. You saw that yesterday. Fundamentally, we use BGP to exchange routing information between networks. That was how we were scaling the internet. We've had, you know, we've had history lessons from LAN. We've had history lessons last year. Apricot, Jack Haverty gave us a wonderful keynote looking through some of the early, early things from his perspective, which is all fascinating to, to see. Um, BGP really let us, in the early 90s, interconnect different networks together without having one network break every other network. At least that was the idea. Um, the current ROC, ROC 4271, uh, describes the spec. Not going to go anywhere near that one. That's really for implementers, in, in my view. For a network operator, if you have to refer to an ROC, something's probably not working too well. Um, 4276, implementation report. That's from folks who actually um, coded, made it work, interoperate with, with other implementations. And 4277, there were some folks there who wrote about the operational experiences, I guess, done to complete the RFC series. And the cornerstone of BGP really is the autonomous system. So this is the concept of a network with a common routing policy. What happens, to, happens a lot, and it's happened over the years, is a lot of people think that my company is an autonomous system. It's not necessarily that. It's used to identify networks with a common routing policy. That's the important part. It's a routing policy. So one company could have different routing policies for different parts of its network infrastructure. So we'll, we'll come to a lot of this detail. Um, right, so the autonomous system collection of networks with the same routing policy, using a single routing protocol, usually single ownership, um, trust and administrative control. I mean, the early years of doing this, I said, oh yeah, it's single owner and that's it, period. And I had somebody, one nanog, I think it was 2002 or three, came out, oh no, no, we, you know, you can't just, so it's usually, it's very unusual to see um, multiple organizations sitting under one autonomous system, but you know, can happen for small um, networks or joint ventures and so forth. But normally, you can point to what's operating autonomous system is a single organization. Trust, absolutely, administrative control, there's one, one thing that's running that network. Identified by a unique 32-bit AS number, uh, so 32-bit integer. Now, again, in the early years, these were 16 bits, so between 1 and 65535. In the mid-2000s, so 2005, 2006, that was all extended out to 32 bits. Um, if you're 
joined the industry after probably 2010, you'll probably have little idea and little care what I'm talking about. If you've been around longer, you will remember going through the pain, as it was from several, of moving from the 16-bit range to the full 32-bit range. And in fact, you, I used to have some slides in here that talked about how to do that, and well, I've ditched those now because nobody really should be using routers that are back from the 2000s to the 2012-13 period. I say should because I still come across folks using really old kit. Um, so there we go. This is, I mean, it's, it's a lot. You know, we had the, the, the talk yesterday about the bogons and so forth. There are, um, in the middle of all that table, um, you can actually see the ASNs used in the public internet, so the 1 to 64495, and then we've got the other range, which is 131072 up to 458751. So those are the ranges that are delegated or will be delegated to the registries, the five regional internet registries, for distribution to um, operators that need them. And the rest of them are either documentation or for, um, what is that, the reserved, um, or they're for private use. In other words, not for use on the, the public internet. And yeah, it's a bit of a complicated range. Um, and then becomes the big question, as, as the presenter was talking yesterday, about how to, how to identify which is real and which is a bogon and, and so forth. Um, what about representing them? So again, in the early, those early years, there was some discussion about whether we should be doing representing ASs as full 32-bit integer, which is uh, what we call the traditional or AS plane format. And you'll see on your routers, you'll probably see something called AS dot. Um, and that took this 32-bit and split it into two 16-bits with a dot in the middle. And if you know your arithmetic and, and so forth, you find a dot inside a number means one thing, at least it does to me, and it didn't really work very well. If you know regular expressions, a dot means something else in a regular expression. It matches any single character. So it caused real awkwardness. So AS plane, if you see any other format, AS plane is the representation we have. So the numbers as you see them right there. Um, okay, so we know what our AS number is. BGP runs over TCP. Port 179 is reserved for that. Um, path vector protocol, not going to talk about this. It's not really, again, for operator. We don't need to go into mechanics and details about what that is. Um, you can read about it if you're interested. BGP relies on what's called incremental updates. In other words, a change in state of the network somewhere is propagated around the internet. Um, now, these today, what is it? The V4 table is about 940,000 prefixes. So when you bring up a brand new BGP session, that's going to take a while. Um, takes what? Depends on your infrastructure, bandwidth of the connection, the router. Two, three, four, five, ten minutes, just depends what you have. The V6 table is 100, almost 190,000 prefixes now. So this takes time. So we really want BGP to send changes. So if a network disappears, we want to notify all our neighbors, networks disappeared, rather than trying to send the entire table each and every time, because that doesn't scale. We have a concept of internal and external BGP. So internal is what runs inside your autonomous system, and we'll look at that in a minute. And then we have external BGP, which is used between adjacent autonomous systems. So in this diagram here, I've got um, you know, AS64500 connected to 64501, so the direct link between router A and C. Um, it's a peering link, um, so direct connection, whereas the other one at the bottom part where 64502 is involved, that is a shared media, could be Ethernet, it's a common one, shared media today, um, for example, at an internet exchange point. Um, BGP supports V4, V6. Um, again, way, way back into the early years of the 90s, um, mid-90s, as it, IPv6 was being worked on and developed, it was kind of a bolt-on to, to BGP before the whole concept of 
BGB becoming multi-protocol was um, introduced. And that would have been, I'll probably get it wrong, probably would have been 98, 99 that the multi-protocol concept appeared. Before then, it was, well, at least the CLI on the major vendors was kind of exciting. Um, demarcation zone is that piece of network between two external um, or two ASs. So we call it demarcation zone or whatever you want to call we call the DMZ. Um, I'm British, living in Australia, so I pronounce things slightly different from how you folks will do. So uh, demarcation zone, some say demilitarization zone, whatever. It's the piece of network between the two um, uh, ASs. And right, so the general operation, uh, BGP will learn multiple paths via internal and external speakers picks the best path, and we'll talk about that, how it does it, and puts that in the routing table. Best path is sent to external BGP neighbors. So each router, talking BGP, participating in the BGP mesh, will pick the best path and send it to its external neighbors. And the way you influence this best path selection, um, sorry, the way you influence the policies is by uh, changing how the best path selection works. The best path selection is properly defined. We have it in a few slides time. You'll see how it works. And the way that you implement policies is by um, changing how the best path selection works. So we, as I said, we support multiple protocols. So RFC 4760 defines the multi-protocol extensions. Um, again, that's for developers, not going to talk about it much here, apart from it enables BGP to carry routing information of protocols other than V4. So it lets us handle MPLS, lets us handle V6, lets us handle multicast, and so on. There's a great temptation, um, not being deli deliberately trying to be sarcastic, there's a temptation to add everything into BGP. Oh, BGP can do this and that and everything else. And if you're sitting on various mailing lists and te tech discussion lists, you'll see people saying, oh, BGP can do that. And it's like, well, we really want BGP to take care of the routing information. And let's try and not use BGP for, you know, social media and whatever else comedy that might be out there on the network. Um, but there's a, there's a big temptation, which at least I'm always trying to resist people even thinking about. Um, the exchange of the multi-protocol NLRI, so in other words, the network layer reachability information, the routes, must be negotiated at session startup. So when we bring up BGP session, it's can we do V4, can we do V6, can we do, can we do. That all happens when um, the session's brought up. And for IPv6, RFC 2545 defines um, the actual multi-protocol to call extensions to handle v6. Um, and so basically the IPv6 address family. So again, this is ancient history by now, uh, or at least it should be. Um, there's, again, when we're using multi-protocols, there's one routing table or one rib per protocol. So the v4 routing table, as you see in BGP, is separate from the v6 one. You can have policies to influence the v for RIB and BGP that are completely separate from policies uh, used to influence the V6 RIB, um, which is really useful, or it can be useful. Um, in much, much later on, we come to really what would be best practices here. And you know, when you're deploying and running an operational network, the device is always try and keep V4 and V6 symmetric. That's how I would put it. In other words, Whatever policy you have for V4, please, please, please do the same thing for V6, the principle of least surprise, so that your V4 traffic is going to go the same way as your V6 traffic. Um, we see some operators still today, especially in my part of the world, you know, my V4 will go in one particular direction, which may be quite a nice path, and the V6 goes on a world tour. Um, that's really not very helpful if we're trying to have V6. Um, eventually, at some point, um, and maybe my next life, <laughs> replacing IPv4. We'll see. Um, and the other important piece is the next hop. 
the IP address of the next router must belong to the same address family of a local router. So if you're getting v6 prefixes from a neighbor, then the IP address to reach that neighbor for the v6 prefixes must be v6. And you know, certainly when I was working at Cisco and you can see the customer requests come in and customers saying, oh, but you know, we need to have, you know, I want to get to my v6 destinations with a v4 next hop. And it's like, well, how's that going to work? You know, if the next router can't do v6, how are you going to get to v6 destination that way? And there's some classic answers which I can't possibly share. So, but that's, that's be important to be aware of that the next hop so in other words, the IP address of the next router um, to get to a v6 destination must be v6. We keep the address families separate. OK, external and internal BGP. So we use BGP in two places. Um, I like to think of it this way. It's much clearer to think of it this way rather than just some kind of protocol that has different um, bits depending where we use it. Let's think of IBGP that's used internally in our network and eBGP that's used to exchange prefixes between different autonomous systems. I mean, IBGP is really the heavy lifter in any service provider network because it carries all internet prefixes or some of the internet prefixes across your backbone. Now, you know, I would say probably 15, 20 years ago, it was fairly common when the internet routing table was just a few thousand prefixes, you go, yeah, I'll carry the full routes everywhere. Today, you know, we're sitting at 940,000 V4, 180,000 V6. Vendors are selling equipment, especially access equipment with limited ribs. Uh, usually the ethernet switches that have had a little bit of layer three added into them and trying to get uh, forwarding table sizes over a million prefixes in those is not going to happen. So these days, IBGP is actually, you know, we configure it much more selectively than um, back, say, 20 years ago. So that's why I say some or all internet prefixes across service provider backbone. And of course, that's where you would put all your customer prefixes. By customer, I mean it can be your own hosting, it can be your own infrastructure, as well as your, your paying customers and end users. EBGP is how you exchange prefixes with other autonomous systems, and it's where the routing policy is implemented as well. Now, model representation, I think a picture always helps. Um, so each bucket is a different autonomous system. Um, the IGP is used so routers inside your network can find each other. That's all the IGP is used for. So pick your poison, whether it's ISIS or OSPF. Um, so it's how your routers find each other. That lets you build IBGP on top. You, you can then exchange prefixes between the different routers in the backbone. And then eBGP is used to transfer prefixes between the two ASs. Um, four words. What did I do? OK, not push hard enough. So we'll look at eBGP first. But that's between speakers in different autonomous systems. These need to be directly connected. So the vast majority of cases we use eBGP, the speakers are directly connected with each other because they've got no other way of finding out how to get from, well, in this case, router A to router C. There's no other way. Um, you know, the common newcomer mistake is, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to run OSPF between myself and my customer who's also using BGP or my peer. Please don't do that. Um, an interior protocol, the, the interior bit means inside, like inside here, not outside. And I've seen so many classics and, you know, I've seen presentations over the years, you know, exchange points will know this pain. They'll see it quite a bit where you see OSPF hellos or I, uh, ISIS hellos popping out on the exchange point LAN because Somebody has misconfigured and, you know, their IGP is trying to chatter outside the network. So please never, ever run an IGP between two different autonomous systems. So that means the eBGP speakers need to have a physical direct link between each other so that they can find each other. Um, IBGP, this is kind of different. So this is used inside the autonomous system. 
and there's no requirement to be directly connected. Because inside our autonomous system, we have OSPF or ISIS, um, so that the routers can find each other. All we need to know in IBGP is how to get to, well, the next IBGP speaker. And that can be, well, it can be lots of hops away, depending, um, because you've got an interior protocol that's taking care of how to do that. Another curiosity, um, well, maybe it's not a curiosity, but another requirement in IBGP is that all speakers must be fully meshed. Now, that's in the spec, must be fully meshed, because an IBGP speaking router only originates connected networks, so what's physically connected to them, or prefixes that have learned from outside the air, so EBGP learned routes. An IBGP speaker will not take prefixes from another IBGP speaker and pass them on. That's the design standard. Um, because otherwise, you just end up with a non-scaling uh, problem. Um, of course, now, if you think about this, now, back in, well, even when I started at, in, in my ISP in the UK, I joined when we had three routers. And that was considered big. I think in those days, UUNet probably had about six or seven here in the US. And that was big. Um, and so doing a full mesh, IBGP wasn't really that hard. I mean, nowadays, when I mean, you saw this morning one of the surveys, how many routers in your network? Oh, 30,000, I think, was one of the answers. Can you imagine doing a full IBGP mesh with 30,000? Probably not. And it, it simply has no chance of scaling. So a bit further along, we'll look at actually what operators are doing today rather than what the design requirement is for IBGP. Um, so it looks something like this. This is a simple four-router picture. Um, so the, well, it should be purple-ish arrows indicate the IBGP sessions. And so here you see each router, A, B, C, D, has an IBGP session with the other one. Um, the next interesting thing. Um, now, we could set up IBGP sessions between physical interfaces. Um, on, on, on the router, so using the physical interface. Um, but then the question happens, what, what do we do if a physical interface goes down? We end up losing the IBGP session. And so best practice, and has been for, I don't know how many years, um, forever really, is to run the IBGP session between loopback interfaces on the router. So each router, you set up a loopback interface, Make sure the address of that loopback is propagated in your chosen IGP, and then run the IBGP sessions between the loopbacks. Most routers will have more than one interface um, facing onto the backbone network in different ways. So if that one interface goes down, you'll still be able to get access to the router through another one. And so that way we ensure that um, even if there's a link failure, the IBGP session stays stable. And you know, even still today, I mean, I still do a lot of tutorials and workshops along these lines in many different parts of the world. I still see people saying, oh, well, but I've only got an Ethernet LAN with all my routers on there. Do I still need to do it? And it's like, well, yes, because there may come a future where, you know, if the company decides they're going to expand, they're going to go to another city, build a new point of presence, and then you've got to redesign things and re-architect the IBGP. Uh, so it's better just to design things, following best practices, design it as you mean to go forwards in the future. So this has become very, very common uh, way of setting things up. Um, and then finally, just the neighbor status. Um, and I've given an example here, Cisco IOS. I've got a Juniper one a bit later on as well. So again, all implementations, whether you know, those that just copy Cisco's way of doing it or Juniper's way of doing it. You can see the list of neighbors, uh, the state of the BGP sessions and how many prefixes have been exchanged and so forth. So that's one example. V6, thankfully, the vendors have made V6 output and configuration look roughly the same as V4. Um, it's not as accurate the same as I wish it would be, but it's roughly the same. So you, you can see the same uh, state. Uh, like that between v4 and v6 and you know the juniper version um, is something more like this so similar idea you can see how many updates have been sent and received and how long the session's been up and how many prefixes have been 
been passed around. Um, and looking at the table itself, I mean, this is just taken from one of the, the workshops I've done years ago. Um, you can see the network and then various other attributes about the prefix, and we'll talk about the attributes next. Uh, so next top is the address of the next router and, and so forth. Um, so typically the table will look like that. Uh, that's V4. This is V6, and do I have a Juniper one? Yes, I do. So the, the Juniper one, again, the same information is there. It's just, well, we presented it in a different way just because it has to be different. So anyway, that's, that's what it all looks like. So the next piece, uh, any questions about the quick preamble before I run onwards? Anyway, I mean, just feel free to jump up and run to the mic whenever um, the feeling uh, takes you. So we'll look at the attributes. We have. Hi, could them. you go into a bit more detail about the loopback peering? Oh, sorry, but uh, the, go into a bit more detail with the loopback interface peering. But the loopback, yes. I can do that. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, a bit more detail about the loopback. Back to the right. So a loopback interface these days, you configure it on the router, it's always there. You can't unplug it. You, well, you can shut it down in software, but you can't unplug it. It won't go away. So the idea being is, you know, if you're looking at a backbone router, for example, in the diagram here, um, I mean, I'll take an example. If we set up IBGP between router B and router C in that example, on the physical link, so we peered between the dot two and the dot three address, sorry, not the dot two, dot three, the physical interfaces on that, that red link between the router B and router C. We set up IBGP on the physical link. That physical link goes down, the IBGP session goes down because the addresses on the physical link are no longer reachable. So, when that IBGP session goes down, uh, then it basically means that anything connected to router C, the routes there, cannot be sent to router B. There isn't any way of doing it. The routes will be sent to A, but because a standard IBGP speaker doesn't send prefixes from another IBGP speaker, that's as far as they go. So router C has now got no way of sending those prefixes to B. And same is true the other way around. Anything connected to router B or learned on router B will not be able to get to C. You know, the classic one I've seen often is, you know, the NOC is connected to A, the monitoring system is there, customers who are connected to C complain they can't get transit because the transit is through router B, and the NOC sits and, yeah, I can ping there, I can ping you, yeah, go and reboot your network, it's not my problem. Well, actually, it is the problem because that physical link between B and C has gone. Now, um, I'll come to your question. Just I'll let me finish this. Um, so I'll, if we set up the IBGP between loopback, so router B, router C, use the loopbacks there, the loopback address is propagated by, IB, by, by the IGP, so ISIS or OSPF. So router C knows how to get to router B loopback. So we set up the IBGP session between loopback on C and loopback on B. Even the physical link goes, we can now get to router B's loopback going via A, right? So link goes down, the IBGP session carries on, customer doesn't notice, internet doesn't notice because you still have a physical path, but through some other part of the network. And that, that's why we do it this way. Hi, I'm Ed Darush from Siena. Uh, I wanted to get your opinion about the uh, design choices of using eBGP versus IBGP on data centers between leaf and spine, for example, or also on broadband services, like if you're running uh, for a customer using BNG and, and uh, connecting to uh, the PON network, uh, two different designs. But Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't really have any. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, the, data, well, the data, data center providers, at least generally what I've been able to see inside the networks, you know, they're doing many different things in many different ways. A lot of them using IBGP, they're using something called uh, multipath. Um, so they end up with, you know, 16, 32, whatever the vendor support, um, paths between different um, infrastructures. 
Some of them have each data center in different autonomous systems, others try and keep it in the same. I don't really have a good feeling or good feedback because everybody has their own, this is the best way and I've made it work. So they don't really say what, share what the secret sauce is, but they all have quite strong opinions about how they want to do things. Okay. So, and folks who are starting up, which is more what I'm working with, are kind of, we just want something to work. So I try and start them that way. Once they've had enough knowledge, they usually work with their vendor who's got the experience of what the kit can do, and um, then they can they scale up after that. All right, thank you. Okay. Right to you. Um, but again, you know, talking to the audience in general and people who are watching the recording afterwards, if there's some data center design best practice for IBGP, EBGP, and so forth, that is consistent across all the different data center operators, I'm happy to add this in here as um, a best advice. Um, but I've, so far, I've not really seen anything that's, this is what everybody does, because it's, well, we do this, but I can't tell you exactly everything. So anyway, for future. Okay. Attributes. So the policy toolkit. Um, so BGP attribute is part of the update. So when we send a prefix to another router, we have the prefix, but we have other necessary bits of information that come along with that prefix as well. Um, and this is what's called an attribute. It's the characteristics of the prefix. Some are transitive. In other words, they go from speaker to speaker. Others are non-transitive, so whether they're kept on the speaker or whether they are used in the AS only. And some of the attributes are mandatory. And it's kind of a little bit of a, a maze working through some of this. So what I'm going to do now, I'll just look at the common attributes that we have. So there are these ones here. We'll look at each one. Uh, the AS path, the next hop, the origin, uh, the aggregator, local pref, um, med, multi-exit discriminator, and community. I've put weight in here. Weight is not a BGP attribute, but software implementations that copy what Cisco did all have weight, and other implementations don't have weight. That's so, um, so I put it in the list, because at least on the implementations that copy what Cisco did, also store the weight in the BGP table, even though the weight is not even propagated to other BGP speakers. It's only used locally on the router. So we'll look at each of these attributes. The first one is the AS path. Um, and that's the sequence of autonomous systems a route has traversed. So in the picture here, AS64501 has originated that slash 16 prefix. Um, I've just picked examples. Um, so AS slash 16 has originated. If we jump onto a router at AS64504, um, so in the middle of the diagram there, we can see the prefix, 194 slash 16, and then a list after it. And that list is the autonomous systems that the prefix has traversed. The rightmost one is the origin. So you can always tell the origin AS yes, because it's the rightmost in the list. And then the one that's adjacent or the closest to the prefix is the neighbor you heard it from, and then the others in between are any other intermediate. Um, so that's the AS path. It's mandatory. It's a mandatory transitive attribute. Um, it has to be set. Um, you have to have it. You can't go and delete it. Dear vendor, please, I want this feature to delete ASs in the path. Uh, well, no, you can't do that. RFC says. Um, but, you know, the requests happen. It's used for loop detection. So when we start announcing uh, prefixes around the internet and they somehow cycle back to us, we want to be able to detect things like that. I've got a picture for it. Um, and also for applying policy. So the AS path lets us do the, I don't want to have traffic going via that AS, or I don't want to get prefixes from this AS, or I don't, you know, you can do policy of routes you receive and traffic that you send based on ASs in, in the path. Um, so loop detection could be something like this. Um, 64501 originates the prefix. It finds its way around to 64505. 
60505 sees it the long way around um, in its BGP table. And it could, it could well send that prefix to 64501. What happens on the router by default in AS64501, we see our own AS in the path, so we discard the, the prefix. We discard the announcement coming from 64505. And again, your vendor has a knob that will let you turn that feature off. Um, I mean, it was mentioned on the Nanog list the other day as well. Somebody had suggested that. Yeah, you could do that. Um, you can turn that off if you want. There's another knob that will, let, that will stop 64505 even announcing a prefix to another AS if that AS um, is in the path. So, but the default behavior is you announce a prefix to an adjacent AS. If they see their AS number in the path, they will not accept that prefix. Um, and that stops this whole announcement loop in the absence of any other policy. And the other one, oops, I don't have the slide for the other one. Okay, I do not have the slide for the other one. So, um, right, okay, so I don't have that. So that was the AS path loop detection I wanted to mention. Um, the next attribute I want to look at is the next hop. Um, now, the next hop, as the name suggests, is the IP address of the next router. So I'm sitting there on router B. I hear prefixes coming from 64501. The next hop is the IP address I'm getting these prefixes on. So I would have my eBGP session set up with the 100.64.1.1 router in the diagram. And so that's the next hop address. So that's quite straightforward. It's quite obviously the next physical router I'm talking to. Um, I mean, if I'm in AS64500 and that prefix has been sent to 64501, well, so be it. They have next hops and so on. On router B, I don't have any visibility of that. Um, what I do is I see that prefix coming in from router A and I set the next hop to 164.101. It's applied as the prefix comes in. Now, the interesting bit is for IBGP. Uh, again, by default, um, if I'm sitting on router C, the next hop address of that external prefix is not who I learned it from in AS64502. So it's not router B. It's actually the IP address of where router B heard it from. So the next hop is actually propagated by IBGP speakers. So, you know, you can say, well, that doesn't matter. That's fine and good. But there's an issue. It means that every external prefix you learn you have to be able to get to the external next hop. And so for a little network, who cares? You might just have two external or three externals. What happens as you get bigger and bigger, start having BGP customers and so forth, you start having a huge number of these external point-to-point -point links you have to carry around in your network. How do we carry these point-to-point -point links around in the network? It becomes a burden on OSPF or ISIS. And so this becomes a serious scaling problem as well. So what we actually do, which is, I'm coming to the next slide, is we actually don't carry external next hops. When the prefix gets to router B, rather than using the external address as the next hop, we make the next hop router B itself. So this next hop self concept, um, which I have on the next slide, I'll show you that. It's, so next hop, mandatory attribute, and it's non-transitive, it's only used within the AS. So next hop best practice, um, set the next hop self. So this is applied on every router that has an eBGP session or any external connected network. So it even could be static connected networks for networks that are prefixes we're distributing by iBGP. It's important to do next hop self. Um, so Cisco IOS, you do it per neighbor. Junos, you do it in a policy statement uh, as one example like that. It's really important to do that. And it's an absolute classic case. I mean, I don't know, I've been doing this probably 25 years now. And all the training and everything I've been doing, still when I do workshops today, this is so often forgotten. And, you know, as long as you're carrying the external next top, at least you don't have a break uh, in the network. But if you forget to carry the external next hop, then we end up on, if I go back, you end up on router C, 
are not able to reach 100.64.1.1. The BGP best path selection, which I hinted at earlier, one of the first tests is, is the next hop reachable? So you see the classic case of the route in the BGP table, the next hop is there, but you can't send any traffic that way. You try and do a trace route, it either says destination unreachable or goes somewhere completely different. So the next hop self is very, very important to remember for IBGP configuration. This goes on the IBGP peerings. So we'll talk about templates later on somewhere. Uh, probably, well, we probably won't have time to do it. Um, but it's part of the IBGP template. On all IBGP neighbors, set next hop self, then you don't need to carry external point-to-point -point links in the IGP. And you know, over the years, I've, I've had to help a lot of operators get out of this serious problem of 20,000 routes and OSPF for ISIS um, because the network wasn't converging. And, you know, their response was, well, vendors should make me faster processors. I was like, well, yes, they could, but then you should have bigger back bandwidth backbone and, and so forth. And, and anyway, you're not using the IGP house designed. IGPs are only there to carry reachability information for devices in your network, not for anything else. Um, there's another next top thing I want to look at, and that's IBGP itself. If you originate a prefix uh, on an IBGP speaking router, we set up the IBGP sessions, as I said before, between the loopbacks. So router B there is originating 100.64.1 slash 24. So if we jump onto router D, the next hop address we see is the loopback of router B, which is great. You know, it's a loopback. I've, dr I've drawn some red lines there. I mean, are the red lines IBGP sessions? Are they the physical infrastructure? I don't care. It doesn't really matter. And that's what we want. We don't want IBGP to care what the physical infrastructure underneath looks like, because IBGP is there to distribute prefixes around a service provider backbone. So, you know, this could be, well, this will be the IBGP sessions, but where are the physical links? You know, the physical link could just be D to A to C to B. It could be just the, the Z like that. Um, or it could be something completely different. Um, which is fine, because if we're sitting on D, to get to router B, how do we get to the loopback of router B? Well, that becomes an IGP problem, right? ISIS, OSPF, they know how to get to router B. And it depends on your backbone, metrics you've used in the IGP, capacities, whatever else, whatever way you run your backbone network. So having that separation is great. And that's what we call recursive route lookup. The next hop in BGP is actually we look up the IGP how to get there. And finally, third party next hop. So internet exchange points know all about this. And this is, this is really helpful. It can be a bit confusing as well, but generally it is really helpful. So we consider this case. We have an eBGP session between router A, um, router B. We have an EGP session, eBGP session between router B and router C. So router C is sending its 166.1.24 prefix to B. B will set the next top address to 164.1.3. B takes this prefix, sends it to A. So A will still see that next hop attached to the prefix as being 164.1.3 and goes, hmm, right, that's the same subnet as I'm on. So rather than changing the next hop address to 164.1.2, it leaves it as 164.1.3. And so even though the the BGP routing information flow is C to B to A, the actual traffic flow will be from A to C, and the other way around. And this is how route servers work at exchange points. And you know, years and years and years ago, trying to explain to folks internally uh, when I was working at the vendor, it's like, no, the route server does not need to be the biggest, fastest device on the network. It's not carrying any traffic. It can be the simplest, cheapest, nastiest bit of hardware that will actually run the BGP code. That's what it could be way back then. And it was like, no, no, we need the top of the range router, you know, multi-chassis. No, it just needs to be able to do BGP. 
And, you know, you look at exchange points today, you know, what are the route servers? You know, it's not like a 300 core, you know, 100 gigabit interface device. It's usually some tiny little box that's sitting in a corner. You know, many of the IXs I look at are the homegrown country exchanges, and they're using little Intel Nuke, Raspberry Pi, I don't know what. Um, it's a very, very simple device because all they're doing is handling BGP prefixes. This is the third party next hop. So that's the positive bit. But on the other side, you may have a peering policy. So you're there, you're sitting in AS64500. You can't stand AS64502. You have nothing to do with it. Don't want to peer whatever else. But if your neighbor 64501 that you have a peering agreement with decides to pass your prefixes on, you're going to get traffic from 64502, like it or not. So it's something, again, you have to be very mindful of as well, because, you know, they'll get your prefixes. You don't have any peering relationship with them, but they will still get your prefixes. So again, back in the day when I was um, in my ISP day, yeah, saw that one too. People that we didn't want to peer with at the exchange point in London, but we still got traffic from them. So it ended up being, okay, we need to deal with this some other way. Right? So these are the two bits. So third party next hop makes route servers work. But on the other hand, you can end up peering with people you probably don't want to have any traffic um, to it, well, from. Um, you don't have to configure anything. So there's no command that says third party next hop. Um, it's there. It's simply BGP checking what is the incoming next hop address. And if it's on the same subnet as the neighbor you're hearing it from, then you just leave it unchanged. All right. What's next? So, summary of this. IGP should carry your route to the next hops. So, we'll please do that. Um, so, OSPF, ISIS. Not getting to the OSPF, ISIS debate. That's been running for 25 years. And, well, as Len said yesterday, he thought that was solved. But anyway, it seems to be fun for every five years just to have another big discussion. Uh, use your IGP, carry the route to the next hops. Uh, recursive route lookup. Um, so remember the cursive route lookup. To get to the IBGP next stop, we ask the IGP, which means BGP is unlinked from the physical topology. You can have a really rough topology, bad backbone, unreliable links. Your IBGP can be stable. Your customers have a good experience because everything is failing over as it should, as it's designed. ISIS or OSPF will converge way faster than BGP will. And so you can fail links over. And certainly these days, you know, people are using BFD, the bidirectional forwarding detection. I hope you know about it. They're using that. So links fail over faster than the blink of an eye. So you can have rough infrastructure, unreliable links, but still run a very reliable network infrastructure. Use Nextop self for external Nextops. So we don't have to carry those around. Um, and then we allow the IGP to make an intelligent forwarding decision. Okay, origin. Okay, this is ancient history lesson. Um, conveys the origin of the prefix. <laughs> so it's the origin as an EGP. Now by EGP, I really do mean the old 1980s EGP protocol, not the generic name for exterior gateway protocols. Um, it was used in the transition from EGP to BGP, and that was like, it was probably even before I was really getting properly involved in, in dynamic routing protocols. And it's still here. Some people still use it. It's transitive attribute. It is mandatory. Um, it does influence the best path selection. And when I get to that bit in a, in a few slides, you'll probably see why it's still hanging in there. Um, three values, IGP, EGP, and incomplete. Now. IGP means, does not mean OSPF for ISIS. IGP means it comes from BGP. EGP means it comes from ye old EGP of last century. Incomplete means it's been redistributed from another protocol. So you may have a static or something connected, and then you've uh, redistributed that into BGP. Um, do I use it? I've never found a use for it. You jump onto the routing table. Uh, I mean, I jump onto route views all the time, and you can get, you can see all these different things and different, what different people are doing. And you can see the different origin codes. Of course, incomplete is used a lot. Uh, the IGP 
and our, our uh, version is used a lot, but there are quite a lot of BGP entries that still have that E there. And I'm pretty sure those folks are not using EGP. And when did Cisco remove EGP from iOS? That was like 2008, 2009, as far as I remember. And even then, I, th I, was, still, I was baffled that anybody would still even need it. Um, OK, speaking of ancient history, <laughs> another one. Aggregator, at least in my humble opinion. Feel free to disagree. It conveys the IP address of the router or BGP speaker generating the aggregate. You, it's optional. You don't have to set it. But once it's set, it's transitive. So in other words, it goes from AS to AS. Um, it says they're useful for debugging purposes. Some people tell me it's useful for debugging. And I'm kind of, well, when I've always designed networks, I've usually generated the aggregate in my IBGP in multiple places. I don't just have it on one router or one point of presence in the entire backbone. I've seen networks have done that. And then it's like they've lost the pop due to a power outage or something. They go, oh, all my prefixes have disappeared. It's like, well, don't you generate your aggregate from multiple places? And some people just don't seem to want to do that. So because we're generating the aggregate from multiple places, I still can't fathom why the aggregator is useful. But you know, I'm sure people have, have a use for it. Debugging only, it lets you know which router generated the aggregate. It's not used in the BGP best path selection process at all. So it's, I suppose it's there. It might have been useful once upon a time. But honestly, these days, who knows? This one is useful. This is probably the most important of the policy attributes. It's local preference. So here we go. Um, AS64501 is originating a prefix. We are sitting in AS64504. So how do we get to 64501? Now, see, it's easy for us. You know, if, you know, we're here in the tutorial now. If we wanted to go upstairs later on for the beer and gear, well, we've got several ways of going. We can go all the way up the escalators. We can go up the, the lifts, elevators there. Or we can go down to the lobby. And you know, there are many different ways of getting up upstairs to the beer and gear. But despite what people try and claim, routers don't have any intelligence. There's computers. You have to program them. You can't just say, hey, router B, figure out what you want to do today. Let's check the weather. Is it rainy, or is it sunny, or is it warm, is it cool? No, we can't do any of this. Local preference lets you determine how outbound traffic goes from your network, how to get to destinations. So in fact, it's the most important and most powerful of the BGP attributes. If you've got a heap of destinations, you can use local preference to determine which path to use. Nobody can override that. Right? It's your ultimate power tool for BGP. Um, I mean, other part of the tutorial series, I mean, I do a, like a two, three hours of multi-homing examples, and the local preference comes up all the time as one of the powerful tools for doing um, traffic engineering and in multi homing So I think about the transitions here. Yes, I do. Um, so we set the local preference on prefixes that are announced in to our AS in the eBGP session. So we match the prefix, and we set the local preference appropriately. So what I've done here is I've matched 174. I'm going to set local preference 800 and what I hear from AS64503. And I'm going to set 500 on what I hear from AS64502, which means the BGP table in AS64504 looks something like this. Right? We've got these two entries. And OK, again, in Cisco style CLI speak, we've got that little arrow next to the one that has local preference 800. Highest local preference wins. You know, it kind of makes sense. You know, if, if the local preference for this is higher than the preference for that, then, well, the high one wins. So it's relatively easy to remember, I always think. But again, if you're a newcomer to it, it's remembering how all these different attributes function is, can take a bit of practice. So there we go. Highest local preference wins. And so traffic from AS64504 to 64501 will go through uh, the router B uh, to router E link through AS64503 and so forth. So that's local pref. Um, 
It's non-transitive. So local preference, when you set it, it's only visible inside your AS. And it's optional. You don't have to set it. And if you don't set it, well, most implementations will just have a default local preference of 100. Um, it's not documented really anywhere. It's just kind of, well, you know, we don't want it zero because we need a bit of flexibility uh, to set local preference underneath the default. So 100 is what's generally used. It's used to influence BGP path selection, determines best path for outbound traffic. Highest local preference wins. The other way around is MED, um, multi-exit discriminator. I'm old fashioned. In BGP version three, it was all called metric. And you'll find again on your vendor CLI, they still talk about metric. I don't know anybody who's done, implemented the M MED code, but maybe somebody has. Uh, Multi-exit discriminator, so we just say med. Um, I say metric, because I've been around too long. So AS64504, um, the 160, the 1 to 0 slash 24 prefix is originated there. And then it is announced to routers C and D in AS64502. We use med to determine incoming traffic flow. Right, so we set the metric on the outbound announcement to tell the neighboring AS which path to use incoming. Right. So here we've, on the AC link, we've set med of 2,000. On the BD link, we've set med of 1,000. And so we look at the routing table, the BGP table on AS64502. We see best path arrow, pardon me, is pointing to the line with 166.1024 med 1000. So just to make it interesting for newcomers, lowest metric wins, or lowest med wins. But then again, you know how OSPF and ISIS work, and you know that the lowest metric wins there, so that should be the, the association that you can make. And I guess that's why I still call it metric. And I suppose the BGP folks will glare at me and say, oh, Philip, it should be med. Yeah, well, but you know, tell the vendors, they still have metric in the CLI, so I still call it metric. And it, it helps when I'm teaching, especially to newcomers, that they can make the association with the OSPF ISIS metric and here. Um, so, you know, there we go. So you can tell a neighboring autonomous system which incoming path to use, and it's the one with the lowest MED that wins. Right, and there we go, right? Lowest MED. So traffic from 64502 to 64504 comes in the D to B link. Um, it's a non-transitive attribute. It's actually only used into AS between adjacent ASs. So even though the upstream gets your med or the neighboring AS gets your med, they won't propagate it on anywhere else. And it's optional. You don't have to set it. And it's used to convey the relative preference of entry points, so best path for inbound traffic. And it's only compared if paths are from the same air. So again, back to the diagram, the paths are from the same air. Of course, vendors have customers. Customers say, yeah, please, sir, can I have? No, I will give you money if you will. <laughs> and so, you can actually compare paths. There's a knob that usually compare paths if they're from different ASs. So Cisco's got the always compare med. Juniper's got the BGP path selection always compare med because big providers have wanted this and they have given money and vendors have gone, yee, we'll write the code. So we have this if you want to do it. And, and some people do. Lowest med wins. Another one that was a big issue was absence of med implies med value of zero. Now, this was defined in RFC 4271, but the previous BGP RFC, RFC 1771, didn't say what to do. And do you have a slide for this? I do have a slide for this. Um, no, I don't. Well, I'm, I'm sure I did. Anyway, I'll talk about it now, and if it's later on, there we go. Um, the previous one didn't define. And so vendor A would say, okay, absence of med means zero. Vendor B would say, oh, absence of med means two to the power of 32 minus one, or two to the power of 32 minus two. 
So if you think about it, if you've got two paths and you send a med on one and no med on the other, what's the upstream going to do? They see two paths, one with a med and the other one without. So how do we compare? And it's like, well, so anyway, so if you were using, say, Cisco, for example, they say, right, you know, med, it's implied med is zero. So we end up with um, you know, a path with absence of med wins. Whereas there was other vendor, I forget who it was, but it was talked about in early start, you know, early 2000s, there was a presentation here about this exact impact. Um, you know, absence of med meant two to the power of 32 minus two. So it meant if the other provider can't be bothered setting a med, then obviously don't want me, want me to use the path. So you could have endless fun just by trying to rely on the absence of defaults. I mean, fun was not the right word. It could end up actually with severe routing loops and other problems between um, peering providers. So this is why in 4271, the med value of zero was actually defined. In absence of med, assume zero. Um, another one, this is again historical, and it only really affects you if you're still using Cisco and Cisco-like um, code is implementations will store the paths in the order they receive them. So your best path might be, say, number three in the list. What happens when you do maintenance on that um, link, that path? So the path disappears, maintenance is done, path comes back, where is it in the list? Because it's stored according to age. So it's now gonna be right to the bottom or to the top, depending which way you look at it. So you do the best path selection. You take the first two, compare. The winner of that one compares the next. Winner compares the next, the next, and, and so forth. Your best path will not be the one that you had when you started off before the maintenance. So it's undeterministic. The med depends on how quick the BGP neighbor is in sending updates, or which router was booted first, and so forth. Um, so it was not deterministic. And so in the early 2000s, um, this had to be fixed. So, and this was the deterministic med feature, which would first, rather than ordering by age, the prefix, the different paths to the destination were ordered by AS number. And then the winners for each AS number group were chosen. So Juniper implemented that by default. So when they started off, that was implemented by default. Um, if you want to break all this, on a Juniper box, you can actually do set protocols, BGP path selection, and they call it Cisco non-deterministic med. <laughs> so my advice for anybody who's using Cisco, Cisco-like, or copy things, please, please, please do the, just BGP deterministic med, and then you'll save yourself surprises, and what's traffic going this way after doing my maintenance? Um, especially if you've got, well, I would say two, but more two more than two, multiple links to another autonomous system. It saves having a lot of surprises. And the thing is, it's, I don't know, this is not really documented as a must do anywhere that I've looked. And I've so many times, you know, I spent years trying to fix the impacts of these things. And it's just such a simple thing. People, please put it in your template if you're using Cisco or Cisco like it. If you're using Juniper, carry on, life is good. Um, IGP metric can be conveyed as med as well, if you really want to do this. And it, I mean, it can be useful because it lets you as an operator, if you've got kind of lumpy infrastructure, you don't want a neighbor of yours to say, right, I'm going to send all my traffic this way through this point of presence if their infrastructure to get to your major core is not really that good. So you can actually take OSPF or ISIS metric and convert it into a BGP med. So it's like that. So you know, Cisco version is this, the Juniper version is um, the other one on the slide as well. And you know, this, this could be an example. Um, you know, AS64501 has got kind of not a great backbone on the left-hand side of it. So they take the IGP metric, which is, well, 20, you know, 10 plus 10, 20, they propagate that as a med. So AS64502 can then take the lowest med path to get to back to the, the core. You know, the best path without this med, it could well be the other way. Of course, they can just go and trample all over this using local preference anyway, but at least you're indicating to them that this is your preference. Please don't use this kind of weird path. Use the much shorter, more direct one on the right. 
Okay, community. I could probably, well, I do have slides that talk for about two hours just in BGP communities, but that's for another time and place. Uh, I just want to do a quick introduction now. Communities are massively powerful, useful attributes. You know, I still weep the times I come to networks, major networks in various countries who don't know what BGP communities are, or just say, oh no, Philip, they're too complicated for me. I'm like, how can you, I don't know, I just can't imagine how you operate infrastructure and do policy on BGP and so forth without using BGP communities. It's just, it's just, it's almost like a condition. If, I, if I'm gonna come help you, you're gonna have to do BGP communities because it just makes managing policy a lot simpler. Um, transitive, optional attribute, RFC 1997 is the spec. RFC 1998 was an example of how Internet MCI used communities. And the representation they had in there was take that 32-bit integer, humans are not good with big numbers. So let's take the big number and try and make it into two smaller numbers. Um, and the two smaller numbers were separated by colons. Um, and the common format that we see and use and have done since the early 2000s has been the first number is your own AS number or just pick a number. Um, and the second one, uh, 65,535 possibilities of things that you can do. There's no meaning to any community value apart from the ones that are defined, um, and so documented in um, IANA. Because a community is kind of a personal thing for your network or your neighbor, they have defined a particular number to do particular policy inside their network. So it is hugely useful for applying policies within an AS or between ASs. Um, hugely useful for internet exchange points as well. I mean, if, for example, if I look at exchange points that are using IXP Manager to manage peerings and so forth and seeing some of the ISP Manager configs, you know, it's a huge use of communities and it just makes it simpler for them to do all that. I mean, you know, proper case study, you know, when these first appeared as beta code in Cisco way back, was it 95, it was 95, 96? You know, you know, one of my team members converted the entire complicated, crazy policy we had into communities, and it just became so simple to manage. It was a big job, but it became so simple to manage. Anyway, stop the promo of communities. Let's explain what they are. So here's a simple example. Um, we've got, you know, ISP here, AS64503. We've got a customer in 64501. We've got an upstream 64504. Usual good practice, you've got a filter on router C that allows the customer prefix in. So if you want to give this customer internet, you've got to go to your border route and add another filter to let that one out. And you keep adding customers, and you've got to update your filters, and you keep adding customers and you update the filters all the time. This is really manageable, isn't it? Not. You get a peer, you don't update any filters apart from the one that lets them into the network. So you can see, as you keep adding customers with their own address space, it starts getting pretty unmanageable because you've got to update filter, filter, filter. And you know, every time a human touches a router, things seem to break. I mean, we know the time when it's major holidays, the internet works. When it's not holiday time, stuff breaks. You know, it's kind of correlation. Nobody is fiddling with the routers, everything works. So humans have something to do with breaking things. So, Let's try and make it simpler for humans not to break things. And so this is where the community is actually very useful. What we now do is, when the prefix comes into router C, we tag it. And I've decided 64503 colon 1 is my customer community. So I tag it with that one, that community. On router E, which goes to my upstream, I have a filter that says any member of 64503 colon 1 gets out to my upstream. And so when I add another customer, and another, and another, and another, well, they automatically get out because if they're a member of that community, they're automatically allowed out in the filters. And if I get a peer, well, peer routes go into another different community. So I tag different classes of customers and links to my network in different communities, and then I just set the policy according to on the different edges according to what I want to do. And, you know, and we, when we did this, I mean, it was like the sales team had a great time because suddenly they could sell all these services that we, well, we couldn't do before. Well, we could do them, but they were so complicated trying to do prefix filters 
uh, whereas with communities, we just start tagging whatever um, folks are, are using. So we've got some well-known communities. I have put five of the most commonly used. There are a lot more than this, but these are the commonly used ones. Um, no export community uh, means do not advertise this prefix to any EBGP peers. So if you've got a prefix, you're announcing it to a neighbor, neighboring AS, and you don't want that neighbor to send the prefix to any of their EBGP peers, take a no export. This is commonly used for traffic engineering and a lot of the, the small networks um, that something I've been helping with over the years. So it's much easier than writing an email saying, hey, folks, can you put a filter in to not allow this prefix out? You just tag it no export, and out it doesn't go. The next one, no advertise. I've got pictures for all of these coming up, by the way. No advertise means do not advertise to any BGP peer. So a prefix comes in from somewhere, you tag it no advertise, it's not announced anywhere at all. No peer. This one's kind of a shame. Do not advertise to bilateral peers. The implementation of that is very low. Normally when I do the tutorial, somebody will jump to the mic and say, I use it. And it's like it's the only person in the room. So, um, but it was another one there intended to try and reduce the amount of clutter and junk in the global routing table. The next one is the black hole community. Uh, this is an RFC, uh, RFC 7999. You've all heard of remotely triggered black hole filtering, yes? I hope you have. This is its community. It means if you tag a prefix with this community and you announce it to your neighbor and they support RTBH, then they will automatically black hole it. It's how we deal with DOS attacks against single IP addresses, multiple IP addresses, and so forth. So um, the thing is, you know, RFC 7999 has arrived very, very late in the day. Um, I mean, it, it's great that it's now a number, but when I show you some examples from the different providers, they've picked their own community for their own RTBH community. So don't just, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to use this one and assume the neighbor knows about it. You have to make sure your neighbor is supporting or they will tell you what community they're using for RTBH. Final one there is graceful shutdown. I mean, if you want to do maintenance on a router, well, you could just do maintenance, you could just do shutdown, boom, gone. So what happens to the 100 gigs of traffic running through the router? Well, you know, your customers get somewhat upset and your neighbor go, and your peer goes, or your neighbor, or your upstream, or your downstream. What happened there? They phone you up, it's like, your link's gone down. Oh yeah, I'm doing maintenance. Well, yeah, we just lost 100 gigs of traffic. So this will shut down, put that on your BGP announcements. It informs the neighbor that you're going to shut the link down so they can reroute traffic on another path so that you can gracefully shut down the router without annoying a huge amount of people and traffic. So I've got pictures for all of these. Uh, there's the NoExpo community example. Um, 64501, you have an aggregate that you're announcing. You're creating subnets. Subnets are usually for traffic engineering so that you can get some traffic on each of the three links there. You want 64502, your neighbor, to see the traffic engineering prefixes so they can load share over the three links. Um, but you really don't want to tell all 77,000 autonomous systems globally, hey, I'm doing traffic engineering with. I know it's fashionable today to try and leak as many prefixes as possible to the global internet. Um, please don't do that, but people do. So the NUX port community is very useful for this localized traffic engineering, where you need to subdivide an address block to be able to send traffic over parallel links. So there's that one. Okay, I don't have the other ones. Maybe they're later on. Um, I'm pretty sure they're later on. The next one I want to highlight is about communities. And this is even more recent. And it's another serious issue. Every vendor has differing policy language behaviors for how they treat well-known communities, how they set communities, how they remove communities, how they replace communities. The command line interface doesn't often tell you the whole story. Um, read the vendor documentation if it exists. Some of them don't even document the community behavior. 
In fact, it became such a big discussion. RFC 8642 recommended reading um, to highlight. I, mean, I know it was discussed on the Nanog list uh, a while back and ITF, IDR, and so forth. This is really important. Be aware. Don't assume that every vendor treats communities in exactly the same way. So you need to know the policy language. If you've got one vendor in your network, it becomes easy because you just have to know their idiosyncrasies. Once you've got two or three different vendors and you're relying them to ship BGP communities around, you really do need to know um, what their different behaviors are. Okay, and then the other one that we've had for a long, long time is, oh, well, Philip, you know, you say the first 16 bits is your own AS number and the final 16 bits is between 1 and 65535. But I've got a 32-bit AS number. What do I do? I can't use communities. I've had that so many times. Philip, I can't use communities because. It's like there's no spec that says the first 16 bits is your AS number. The first 16 bits is a number. Pick any number. So use private AS. There are plenty of private AS numbers, you know, 64512 upwards. You've got 1,023 that you can use. Pick one of those. You know, many of the big providers do that. You can do it. Oh, well, but you know, I want my AS number. Well, there's a solution for you now, RFC 1892, the BGP large communities. And if you thought 32-bit communities weren't enough, we now have 96-bit communities. Um, and so, the large community attribute. So it's a new attribute called the large community. And it's got three 32-bit fields. First one, generally your local AS number. The second one, your local operator-defined action. And the third one is a remote operator-defined action. So it can basically say that local AS such wants this activity done in its peering with AS such and such. Or variation. You can use them for whatever you want. But that's the general what folks are, are using them for. And, you know, this allows operators using 32-bit AS numbers to peer with others using 32-bit AS numbers and define policy actions. In fact, you can now define 4 billion policy actions. So it's quite big. So, you know, a couple examples here. Um, or again, if you've got access to IXP Manager, you can have a look at um, some of the, the, the back-end configuration it produces because it's used quite widely in there. Um, as for vendor support, I still find large communities kind of a little bit more lacking than I expected. You know, I'd like to teach this on the hands-on workshops that I do, but even the software I'm using doesn't have the large communities in them as yet. So it's... Well, it's been around for a few years, but it just seems to be not quite as um, much available as I would have expected. Anyway, a couple examples. Um, what's next? Right, the path selection algorithm. Why is this the best path? So this is pretty much from the RFC, but I've introduced some of the vendor vagaries in here as well, just for completeness. Um, First one, remember what I was saying earlier about next hop? Next hop has to be reachable. Well, step one, do not consider path of no right to next hop. So it may be in the BGP table, that doesn't mean it's reachable because the next hop may not be reachable. And if the next hop's not reachable, the path will not be considered at all. That's a very, very common, ah, oh, Philip, why does my BGP not work? Well, can we get to the next hop? Oh, didn't think of that. So very important to make sure the next hop is carried around. Very important. Strongly recommend the next hop self. Second one is ancient history. I don't even want to mention synchronization. Oops, I did. Um, please don't even, well, if you're curious, look it up. Don't even think, don't even go anywhere near that. This is back from the early 90s. Uh, step three is peculiar to folks who use have the wait feature in the BGP implementation. Weight is local to the router, and it's used to override local preference. Right? Local preference gives you best path for your entire AS. Weight can override that. So, for example, if you've got two paths to another AS, you may have local pref one way, but maybe the other router has got special things you need to do, could have special customers, so you put a weight on those destinations, and you can punt them out the other path. 
Again, for us in the UK, we use that extensively. We use that weight feature um, because it let us do traffic engineering depending on which customer it was and where they were connected. Anyway, so that's not really in the path selection process, but that's where it appears on implementations that have the weight. So really the next one is highest local pref. So remember what I said, local preference is the most powerful attribute. So there we go. It will override anything else. So if somebody sends you um, a destination over multiple paths, you can choose the exit, no matter what they try and do. I mean, it's probably been mentioned it's on the list loads of times. You know, you've seen the monster AS path prepends that people seem to love doing. You know, I bet you most of that is people trying to override local prefs. You can't. Local pref wins every single time. 200 times prepend will not win. And I, I record these. I've been recording these since 1999, and they're just some amazing ones. You know, back in the earlier years, people, you know, if they did more than 255, you could cause routers to crash. Um, th I think that most of that's gone now, but I've been watching it all that time. You still get 200 times prepends popping up every now and then. Local preference wins. Um, prefer locally originated routes. So this is locally originated over being originated somewhere else um, in the network. Shortest AS path. When your travel agent gives you an itinerary jumping through five cities and doesn't give you the nonstop, what do you say? Nonstop, please. This is it. Shortest AS path. Why should I jump through five ASs to get to a destination when I can connect to them uh, more closely? Um, Again, after that, so if the AS path lengths are equal to the same destination, then we look at the origin code. And this is where some operators are still using the origin code. Because if they've redistributed the prefix from another routing protocol, they would prefer the path where BGP has originated the prefix versus the redistribute. And some operators are using the tagging the prefix with EGP as the origin code because they're not running the 1980s protocol. They really are not. Um, they're tagging EGP because they're trying to use this part of the path selection process. Carrying on, here we go with MED. MEDs are compared if paths are from the same neighboring AS. If we've got deterministic MED, then we order them by AS number first. And then if we have always compare MED on the Juniper equivalent I mentioned earlier, then we compare for all paths, even if the neighboring ASs are different. So this isn't in the RFC. Line eight is lowest multi-exit discriminator if paths are from the same AS. But the customers have come along and said, please, Mr. Cisco, please, Mr. Juniper, I want, I want, I need, I will pay you for. So we have these modifications in there. Step nine, prefer EBG path over IBGP path. So this is the so-called hot potato routing. If the destination's outside my network and I'm sitting there on the border router, right, the traffic goes out. I'm not going to carry it across my backbone because it's costing me money to do that. I'll offload it as soon as I can. Step 10, path with the lowest IGP metric to the next top. So now we're looking for highest bandwidth, fewest number of hops, to the border of the, the network. So if we're sitting somewhere in the middle of the network, we'd rather use the highest bandwidth, lowest number of hops to get to uh, the EBGP peer or the edge, rather than trying to go over a lower bandwidth link. So metrics matter. So when you're designing your IGP, or SPF or ISIS, don't just use the defaults that the vendors provide. You need to come up with a reasonable design for your IGP metrics so that you don't fall foul of step 10 here as well. But there's more. Okay, for EBGP paths. Um, well, this is not in the RFC either, um, because you know if we want to follow the RFC, uh, what is it? So trying to work my way through here. Right, if we turn on multipath, we put n parallel paths in the forwarding table. So we've got BGP multipath, and we've got, say, three eBGP sessions on the router with a neighbor. Then we end up with three entries in the FIB, one for each path. Right? So that's what the multipath piece is. 
If the router ID on the, on the two paths or whatever are the same, we go to the next step. So we're following the RFC. If the router ID is not the same, we pick the oldest path, which is not the RFC, but that's what Cisco did. Right? So we pick the oldest path, the idea being the oldest one is the most stable one. But of course, when you do maintenance on the oldest path, it becomes the newest path, and your backup becomes the oldest one, and so you end up with this flip-flop between the external paths, depending if a link goes up or down. So that's not very happy either. So you can turn it off, BHP best path compare router ID, uh, which then removes this step 11, and we go to step 12, which becomes the lowest router ID. So we're starting to get a little bit desperate in the path selection. Right? We pick the lowest router ID in the, the paths that we, because each path has a router ID, the IP address of the router that introduced it to the AS. That's the lowest router ID. And so um, I think that's right. Both Cisco and Juniper use the oldest path. And you can turn it off. Um, so some, some operators I've, I've helped over the years, they want to turn this off. They don't want the oldest path. They want it done by router ID because they want the stability. Other people want the oldest path because, and, and so on. It's, it's just like two, two positions, and that's what we're going to do. Um, so lowest router ID. Uh, route reflector I will get to next. Um, so this is the cluster list, which I'll talk about. And then finally, the lowest neighbor IP address. Now, IP addresses on a network or an AS are going to be unique. They have to be unique, otherwise, how's it going to work? This is desperation. I call this the desperation page of the BGP path selection, uh, because you really don't want to be here, because things are now dependent on IP addresses or router IDs of neighbors. And this can change. You, know? you update a route, you change configurations, peers change. It could influence your path selection. So it's generally better to try and have path selection finishing in this page, or even better, this page, so that you are much more deterministic and have a much more stable um, outcome. Anyway, that was the path selection. OK, the multi-vendor warning. Make sure the path selection processes are understood for each brand. They are different. The defaults are different. People like copying Cisco. People like copying Juniper. Um, they are different, so be aware. Don't just assume. I remember early deployments of dual Cisco Juniper infrastructure, and it was like, well, this show used to work on Cisco. Why can't it work on um, And same as other vendors have come along. They've used different defaults. It, it's worth spending time figuring out what the defaults are and trying to replicate the network on the new brand of equipment to make sure the behavior is the same. You know, all have to follow the RFC. We can't go turning off bits of the RFC. But as I put in quotes there, because of customer demand, each vendor has slightly different implementations, extra steps, extra features. Um, so you need to be aware of, of those ones especially. OK. Policy, I'll, it's, I've just got a few slides of policy. Um, because, and this is always a bit, you know, you know, over the years discussing with the Nano Program Committee, it's kind of hard to stand here and talk about policy because the policy language used is very specific to each vendor. Um, and so we end up giving lots of vendor examples and then, well, you know, the tutorial is not vendor neutral and, oh, well, Philip, maybe you can do Cisco and Juniper and Huawei blah, 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 and, and so on. It's like it ends up becoming a tutorial on how to use vendor equipment rather than trying to show BGP. So, <sighs> The policy part is more, you need to know what your vendor policy language is. Um, and why we apply policy? Well, you can't just plug routers in and go. Policy is all about your external relationships. You want to control who you peer with. You want to control who you give transit to. And you want to control who you get transit from. Traffic flow control, that's also important. Um, we don't have infinite infrastructure. And even though the bandwidths we're talking about today are huge in a lot of places, as we know, traffic grows to fill the bandwidth available. So we need to be as efficient as we can using the resources that we have. Um, so what I call external link load balancing. Congestion avoidance. 
you know, customers are happy as long as there isn't any congestion. So we need to be able to handle that. And so this whole terminology is traffic engineering. And um, as I say, it's a whole other tutorial um, that I have that just deep jumps into doing what all the traffic engineering is. And again, some of the best practices, how to start, how, you know, simple, straightforward steps that have to be made. Um, how we apply the policies, um, we can set BGP attributes. So local preference, I mentioned. There's the multi-exit discriminator, the MED. ASPath, we can do policy according to that. And the BGP community. If your peer has an extensive support of BGP communities, you can make extensive use for your traffic engineering. If your peer upstream has no idea what communities are, cancel the service, go find somebody else. I mean, it's, I have to be blunt now. I mean, I was much more careful 10 years ago about saying, but seriously, today, it's very hard to do policy if, if, you're, if you're upstream cannot handle BGP communities because um, it's such a powerful tool. Advertising or filtering prefixes, so what you advertise, how you advertise them, what you accept, how you accept them. You can advertise a filter according to AS number or the AS paths. Um, there may be particular paths you don't want to cross. Um, advertising or filtering prefix is based on the community membership as well, what's been defined. The tools, implementations have tools to apply policy, so for manipulating prefixes, filtering prefixes, or AS path manipulation, AS path filtering, community attribute setting and matching, I mean, policy language tutorials, I mean, all, all the vendors are happy to explain why their policy language is the best and all the rest. So, you know, you can go, go play with all that. Uh, again, a multi-vendor environment, trying to make sure what works on vendor A to make it behave the same way as in vendor B may not be as straightforward as it first seems. So if you're making the investment of a dual vendor policy, then you need to make the investment in the dual understanding how the configuration works as well. Capabilities, just one slide about this. Um, so BGP is extensible now. Um, there's no BGP5. I mean, that was the talk in the mid-90s when IPv6 was coming along. Oh, well, maybe we should have a BGP5. There isn't. Because what's happened is BGP now has got this capability negotiation. So as part of the open message, um, it will try and negotiate what capabilities the other speaker supports. So I say, I can support all this. What can you support? and the other one will respond with what it can or cannot, well, what it cannot do. Um, and there's a range of codes, so there are up to 255 possible capabilities. The first 63, sorry, 64 are assigned by IANA, following IETF consensus. The next, you know, 192-ish um, are assigned by IANA, first come, first served. Not quite 192, 100, well, funny number. And then the final lot are experimental use. So, the current ones, yeah, I've fitted them all into the table here. I've listed them all. That doesn't mean they're all used. Um, the common ones today, of course, multi-protocol, because most of us are doing v4, v6, MPLS. Some are still doing multicast. Route refresh, fundamentally important. Um, I mean, that was a big one that arrived in the early 2000s. Uh, the BGP outbound route filtering, the ORF. Graceful restart, of course, and four byte AS numbers, pretty much every implementation now supports for by AS number. So these are the common ones that I am I'm seeing out there. But I put the whole list, I hope that's the current list there. The RFC that goes with them, otherwise if it's an internet draft, it still means it's being worked in the ITF processes. Um, so scaling, I have 20 minutes left. So we'll look at scaling. Um, and I'll look at the scaling techniques we use today. I've included a few others which I'm just going to kind of breeze by. Um, I've included them for completeness, because if I don't mention them at all, somebody will come after and say, oh, Philip, what about? So, scaling techniques. So, I remember I talked about full mesh IBGP. Well, that didn't scale. We found that out very quickly in the mid-90s as networks grew bigger and bigger, we couldn't maintain the IBGP mesh. Configuration scaling. I mean, today everybody's talking about automation, which is all great, but you still got to produce the code that goes onto the box that does all the, um, the routing, the BGP sessions. So as the internet grew, we had issues scaling IBGP between 
beyond a few peers, implementing new policy. Because in the early internet, implementing new policy, because BGP sends updates. You've remembered that. It sends updates. So the update goes out. You can hardly come along and say, hey, remember that update I sent two days ago? Can I get it back, please? So if you need to change your policy, all that we could do was shut down the BGP session. Because then your prefix would vanish from the whole internet, bring back the BGP session, and then you could implement this new policy. Now, I remember in the early years, you know, I would, every Tuesday morning, 4 a.m., my alarm clock was set to implement the new BGP policy, because that's all that was available. I had to go physically, shut down the BGP session, bring it back up again, and um, make sure everything still worked. So there's no such thing as we have in the modern devices. Um, and of course, network stable, stable, scalable, and simple are givens. So configuration scaling, this is grouping BGP peers together. Uh, route refresh, route reflectors. I've included soft reconfig in here, which I'll explain what that is. Confederations, I mean, I know some operators still use confederations, but today people don't deploy, as far as I'm aware. Pretty much everybody is deploying route reflectors. And route flap damping is, please don't do it unless you really know what you're doing. Uh, and I'll explain quickly why. So the configuration scaling are basically well, Cisco-style peer groups or the Juniper's BGP groups. How we group BGP peers together to make it simple or easier to manage configuration on the box. Um, so it allows operators to group peers with the same outbound policy. Configuration easier, less prone to error. Remember the humans are the problems in the network. Uh, make configuration more readable. Members of, of these peer groups can have different inbound policy, and we can use it for eBGP as well if we want. Uh, so Cisco called it peer groups. Um, of course, they've replaced all that. They now um, have something called update groups, which is an internal optimization. But I still like the old code that groups peers together because it works the same way as Juniper's BGP groups, which also lets me group peers with the same outbound policy together. Very, very useful for internal BGP. Very, very useful for peering at internet exchange points as well, rather than coming up with a, diff, you know, a, a separate config for every single of the 300 providers I'm peering with. Um, so at iOS, it looks something like this. We give it a nice name, and then we just apply the group to the individual neighbors. Um, and this is for eBGP, and I've got a Juniper example somewhere in here as well. Um, to show how that works. I think, yeah, this is the next one. So it's the same thing. We, we set up a group. We call it a nice name. Nice descriptive name, please. You know, there's so many places I've jumped into where it's not a descriptive name. It's got some kind of serial number thing. It's like, what's this doing? Oh, yeah, they'll look up our internal database to find out. Please don't do that. You know, it's, we need the code to be readable because humans still have to try and check how a lot of this stuff works. Um, so grouping them together for iBGP, it's just my best practice. So whichever vendor kit um, of the folks I'm helping, I say just create the peer group, even if you've only got one neighbor. There will come a time where you need to add another one. And you can just add it to the same group rather than having to um, you know, reinvent or redo the configuration. Um, and use it for eBGP as well. I mean, if it's just a standard, simple bilateral peering that you're only going to have one of, well, why bother? But if you're having multiple peerings with another AS or going to an internet exchange point, then it becomes much more efficient um, on your own configuration to look at grouping the peers together. Okay, dynamic reconfiguration. So this is the non-destructive policy changes. I mean, I think these days, this is just a default that nobody really pays attention to because what I'm finding now is, at least for the hands-on workshops that I'm doing, you know, I'm still using legacy vendor code that's current but legacy, and that doesn't have this, any of this auto feature. Um, as I was saying before, historically, routers only stored prefixes which um, were accepted by incoming policy. Right? So anything that was failed the policy was discarded. Now, some vendors today are still keeping those prefixes that um, fail the policy. 
because you know if you change a policy, at least you've still got the copy of what you, you threw away. It's like having the trash can but not emptying it. Um, but in old days, we had megabytes of RAM. Right? When I started, it was two megabytes of RAM in a router. So you really didn't want to keep anything that you didn't need. Um, so of course, you know, we would throw prefixes away that failed the policy. If we changed the incoming policy, we somehow had to let the neighbor know that we needed that prefix again. Shut down the BGP session, bring it back up. There's a question approaching. Hi. Uh, just wanted to say, since we don't have that much time, yep. um, I wanted to ask if you were going to get to URPF. Um, <laughs> I won't that... be, unfortunately. No, okay. Um, but, you know, if we, during the break afterwards, you know, I can happily have, have a quick chat if you wish. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it's, this is like a three, four hour thing. So as I said to the Nano PC, I will go as far as I can and then the rest, well, maybe San Diego if I'm lucky. Um, so, right refresh, so, history, we didn't keep anything that failed the policy. So we had to change, we had to shut down the BGP session, bring it back up again, and then there we go. So changing anything in BGP was a real pain, any policy. So first step really was by Cisco, um, the soft reconfiguration concept, which was great until we ran out of memory because our four megabyte of RAM by then router, just as soon as we got the full BGP table, boom, we'll fool up. So it was a great solution, but it was a problem because suddenly we had to spend thousands of dollars upgrading to eight megabytes and 16 megabytes to try and accommodate the growing BGP table. Um, so it became a bit of an issue. Um, but the nice thing with this was that we didn't have to shut down BGP session. We could just dig up this stored uh, set of prefixes, rerun them through the policy, and um, everything was updated to what we wanted to do. So this is what is known as the adjacency rib in. So it's basically what we've learned from the neighbor and it's stored in this uh, slightly different rib. Um, so something like that would be the concept. Um, you turn on the soft reconfig and you had this uh, add rib in appearing. So because soft reconfig was fine if you had limitless memory, which in the early, well, mid 90s was hugely expensive. I mean, those of us who are around then will know how expensive the memory and the routers were. So route refresh was a lot more sensible. That's what appeared. Uh, the peering remains active. And what you do is if policy change, a notification is sent to the neighbor saying, hey, send me all your routes all over again. And so that was route refresh. And today, many vendors, when you change the policy, there's an automatic route refresh happening. Some of the older implementations, what are called legacy implementations, you still have to manually do the right refresh. But in the newer ones, it's automatic. So it's made things a lot, lot easier, but it's still good that you're aware that this is going on. So as I said at the bottom, be aware, not all vendor implementations do an automatic route refresh. So you really need to know. And I, I see this especially when I'm doing hands-on training courses um, in different parts of the world, that. Some folks don't know this is a default. Other folks assume that all equipment does this, and then they get unstuck because they haven't done the right refresh. So again, you need to know. It's not always automatic. So use the right refresh capability. Don't ever do a hard BGP reset. Consider a hard re reset the same as rebooting the box. It can often take almost as long. Um, you know, really don't want to cause any more instability in the network than already is there. And then the next issue, origin validation. Now, I'm not talking about RPKI in this because it comes much further on in, in this and in the rest of the series, but I want to point this out. Route origin validations means checking to see if the prefix received has a valid row. In other words, it's originated properly, crypto cryptographically signed, and um, we can actually use it. Um, Routers implementing ROV, so this route origin validation, apply the validation results via the existing policy language and process. So valid, it's allowed. Invalid, it's dropped, not found. It's allowed at the moment. How is incoming policy applied on routers today? Well, 
routers that maintain the edge rib in, fine. Something changes in the route origin validation, the router just dips into edge rib in, reruns the policy, life is good. Routers that do not maintain it, guess what they do? They do a route refresh. They say, hello neighbor, send me everything. Now, you can think about it. Um, so, well, last week when I updated the slides here, 360,000 V4 and 78,000 V6 rows. If an operator comes along and changes anything part of their rows, such that maybe a prefix goes from invalid to valid, they fix something or they break something, guess what these routers do? Hello neighbor, send me everything. And they'll do this lots and lots and lots of times. In fact, it was so bad in some of the networks that um, were pointing this out that they shut down peerings. They said, until you stop this bad behavior, we're not gonna peer with you. So again, be aware of it. So it impacts a certain large vendor. <laughs> so Juniper implements AdRib in by default. Cisco does not. Um, until the most recent iOS XR, um, I know it's coming in there, if not already. iOS will never get it because that's disappearing. iOS XE, I haven't got one that seems to be able to do this properly. So for Cisco, you've got to turn on soft reconfiguration, um, the soft reconfiguration I just mentioned. Because if you don't, the router is going to do a route refresh and bombard your peer uh, with route refresh requests. So if you see a huge amount of chatter coming from BGP neighbor, it might be this that they're doing ROV, and they're just bombarding you with uh, route refreshes. And it is bombarding. It's like one operator was looking. It was just an incredible amount of updates that they were uh, seeing. Anyway, so that was just an aside from this. It's very early on in the tutorial, but I thought I'd point it out here while we're doing route refresh. Um, if you have route refresh, but don't have this adjacency rib in, you have a bit of a problem. Okay, what are we, 10 minutes? 10 minutes, not even 10 minutes. Right, route reflectors, quickly. This is how we scale IBGP today. There's no other way, this is what we do. So 14 routers in that pretty picture is 91 IBGP sessions. Imagine what's 1,000 routers. And as I was saying earlier, whoever did the survey there got 30,000 in the network. Can you imagine a full mesh with 30,000 routers? I can't either. So we don't want to go there. There are two solutions. Actually, BGP Confederation was one, it came first. And then well, about six months later, Route Reflector arrived. Um, BG Confederation is pretty complex. We don't really deploy this today. At least I don't want to deploy this today because it's complex to do and it's fairly destructive to move from full mesh to confederation. Route Reflector is very, very simple. Um, and the concept is this. Prefix comes in from the outside into router B. Um, by standard IBGP, B will distribute it to A and distribute it to C with the direct IBGP sessions. To implement a route reflector, we do that. We convert router A into route reflector and C is its client. So now, route A accepts the prefixes it learns from B and passes them on to router C. Why we didn't do this from day one, who knows? But anyway, so this is what we do today. All the workshops that I've taught all over the place, we do it this way. Right? I no longer build full mesh IBGP. I used to, and then teach people how to convert to route reflector. And now I'm like, why am I going through the pain of the full mesh IBGP? Um, we just go like this uh, from, from day one, and this is much more straightforward. And folks come to me and say, oh, I've only got three routers. Doesn't matter, just do route reflector. Because you'll be adding. You'll be adding as time goes on. So rather than trying to redesign the network, we can just keep uh, using the route reflector design. And so forth, your, your network ends up looking like this. So A, B, and C in the diagram could be different points of presence, core router and the pop, access routers could be you know, the clients. So the clients talk to the reflectors. So the only neighbors the clients have are the route reflector, the one route reflector. So the clients in the top there connect to router A, that's it. So the clients have one IBGP session. They still get all the same information, but one IBGP session. Routers A, B, and C there have full mesh still, the core of the network. Um, so this is really simplified how we do things. And the hierarchy, we can have it. We can go as far as we want. You know, the clients you see in the diagram there, 
could be right reflectors for other clients. And those could be right, and so on and so on. You know, some of the networks I've helped build, big national networks, probably four or five layers deep, just using right reflectors. Um, I don't know, I've never run into any scaling issues um, this way at all. Um, there are various rules, but you know, generally you want to follow the, I'll skip this, you generally want to follow the physical design of your network. So here I've been a bit more specific. The two, you know, a point of presence might have two core routers for redundancy. And what I tend to do and what I've done since, well, 1995, is the two core routers are route reflectors for the pop. To get my redundancy, what I've done is each client talks to the two route reflectors. And the two route reflectors are actually in different clusters. Not the same one, the different clusters. I've always done that that way. It's always worked fine. It means that I don't end up with weird things happening. I've helped debug national networks with one set of route reflectors given the same, uh, well, cluster IDs. And this has been very scary. You know, the two, the two route reflectors are in geographically separate parts of the continent. They lose something in the middle or they insert something in the middle and they've broken the entire backbone. So, because they followed the notes, um, follow the vendor spec. So instead, keep it within the point of presence. The two core routers are separate clusters, and each one talks to the clients. That's how I've always done it. It's how everybody else I've seen do it. Um, so that's my, my good experience from there. Um, so solves the IBGP mesh problem, packet forwarding not affected, normal BGP speakers coexist. The only thing that needs to know about the route reflector concept are the actual reflectors themselves. The client, they don't, they don't know. It's just another BGP speaker. Easy migration. Um, don't do what we did away back in UK days of, yeah, maintenance, yeah, we'll, we'll just convert the whole UK network to using route reflectors. I mean, it worked, but when I look back on it and the magnitude of what we did, that was just crazy. But anyway, you know, we were young then and foolish and so forth. We learn, so we just, you know, in the ones that I've done since, it's just, we do everything. You know, let's try this corner of the network first. Until you're happy with it, we'll wait a few days, then we we'll do the next, and so forth. Um, where to put the route reflectors for IBGP, follow the physical topology has always been strong advice. Um, a lot of folks are now using uh, separate appliances for the route reflector, but these are usually attached to the core routers. It's when you have the route reflector sitting in city one, serving a cluster in city two, 3,000 miles away, that you probably run into um, scary issues. So don't do that, you know. Have the route reflector or reflectors sitting as close to or actually in the, the path. I just use the standard core routers. It's not much of an overhead for the control plane compared with everything else that they're, they're doing. Um, what else? Um, so migration. So. Pick the piece of the network. So here uh, on router D, we see that E, F, and G are clients. We set up that specific one-line configuration. And then once that's working, we just strip out the rest of the full mesh. So migration is actually very, very simple. And anyway, so those are two scaling techniques, strongly recommended, standard practice today. The route refresh, the route reflectors um, for scaling BGP. Confederations is pretty much historical now. There's still networks with design, set up IBGP confederations. So the slides are here as FYI. I'm not going to run through them. Um, but the main issue is you split your network into sub ASs and then the EBGP with each other. And, but the world sees you still as the one AS. So you can see the potential migration issue. It's, you know, you've, you know, you've got to basically redo the configuration. Um, so it's there. I mean. The usual comparison, route reflector is very scalable, easy migration, uh, it's very low complexity to migrate to. And the final one that's also a do not do, this was intended as stability for 1990s, network instability for the 21st century is my tagline. This was, route flap damping was introduced to solve a problem in the late 90s. We should have stopped doing, trying to even think about this in 2002, but it took a lot of work by researchers to demonstrate to the community that flap damping was actually a really bad idea. And in a quick summary all the way at the back, um, where is the quick summary at the back? 
Uh, read the RFC. RFC 7196 explains the issues. And if you want to do flat damping, read the RFC or the RIPE uh, Writing Working Group document, which is basically the same as the RFC, which explains what the issues are. It was there to solve a problem in the late 90s. It does not solve problems today. In fact, it makes things worse. And it's scary reading vendor documentation about what to turn on the routers. They're still saying turn this stuff on. Please, for goodness sake, do not, unless you really, really know what you're doing, because it will seriously break stuff. OK, um, that's pretty much got me to the end, <laughs> which through, as I predicted. Um, so yes, because it's, because it's a three, three hour-ish tutorial, not, not just a two hour. So the rest of the slides are there. They'll be on the, on the website. Um, as I said at the start, we've recorded quite a lot of um, parts of this presentation. It's on the NSRC video page if you want to go and have a look at it. Um, if, you, if you have a look at the rest of the slides, the things you don't follow or want clarity on, I'm happy for you to drop me a note, uh, philip at nsrc.org, or talk to me. I'm here the rest of the day, tomorrow. Um, I hope it's been useful. I hope it wasn't too fast, because uh, there's a lot to cover. Um, any questions? I think, well, we've run out of time, really. So if there are any questions, um, I'd suggest uh, come find me during the break um, or the rest of Nanook. Otherwise, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your time here.